Jesus. Hallelujah. Pastor Josh and Anna are in Canada. Praise God. Traipsing around in the snow. Glory to God. I'm happy for him. He asked me one time, I'm, I'm, by the way, I'm, I'm Anna's dad, if you don't know, and uh, her mom is right here, and so, uh, and uh, Pastor Josh's father-in-law, so you know we have a good relationship, or he wouldn't have asked me to speak while he was gone, amen? But uh, we're happy to be here with you and excited to be a part of Trailhead and all that's going on. We're, just, we're glad we could be here with you. We put in a lot of prayer this week and stood with you and and uh, was believing that there, there wouldn't be any damage. So thank God for His goodness and mercy. Amen? Amen? Praise God. But this morning, I want us to get right into the Word of God. I want you to look in Colossians, the, the first chapter. I'm going to read it to you, actually, out of the uh, Amplified Bible. And what I want to do is this. Pastor Josh shared with me that, that he was going to be ministering a lot on faith this, this month. And, and uh, you know, I've been in the ministry uh, in August, we celebrated 40 years of actually pastoring, praise God. And uh, so uh, we've been teaching faith and stuff for a number of years. And so I told him, I said, I would try to come up with something that, we, that maybe we could use, praise God. But uh, what I want to do is just touch on some things on faith on how we can receive the blessings of the Lord. Anybody here want to harvest a blessing in your life besides me, praise God, amen. Well, in Colossians chapter 1, we find that God has actually done for us what it needs to be done for us to begin to move over into a place where our lives can be changed and transformed. In verse 12, he says, giving thanks to the Father. And you know, we should all the time be thanking God and praising God for His goodness and what He's done for us. Amen? Living with a thankful heart, a thankful attitude unto our Heavenly Father who has qualified us and made us fit to share the portion which is the inheritance of the saints, God's holy people, in the light. Aren't you glad today that God has already qualified you to partake of the inheritance of the saints in light? Come on, you don't have to qualify yourself. When you make Jesus Lord, you are qualified to walk in all that God has for you. Hallelujah. And you know, the Bible says that God is not withholding any good thing from those who will walk uprightly before Him. And so we begin to thank God that we didn't just get saved and have to hang on and hold out until we get to heaven someday. But no, God has a life of blessing for us. He has a life of victory. He's called us to walk in success, not failure. Amen? I'll prove it to you. Look on down. He says in verse 13, The Father has delivered and drawn us to Himself out of the control and the dominion of darkness and has transferred us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. Now that's enough to get you excited today because God says here that, that you know, in, in 2 Corinthians 5, the Bible teaches us that we become a new creation in Christ Jesus. And then He went on and said it was God in Christ reconciling us unto Himself, bringing us back into favor and harmony with Himself. Amen? So Jesus... Jesus was God incarnate. Amen? God came to us in the form of His Son, and God the Father and God the Son came together. Jesus said, I come only to do the will of my Father. And so we find the Lord Jesus bringing God's will to humanity again. And so in so doing, God does this. God delivers and draws us to Himself out of the control and the dominion of darkness. What's that mean? When you make Jesus Lord of your life, you're no longer under the authority, the dominion, the control of the devil. Amen? Come on. Sin doesn't have a right to rule in your life. Come on. You need to get a hold of this. Religion says, well, you know, you've got to live in some sin. Well, religion is, a, is, is a, a product of Satan. Are you listening to me? Satan's the god of all religion. When the Lord Jesus was on the earth, he fussed at religious people more than he did the sinners. Amen? Why? Because religion, it, it, you know, it, it destroys you, deceives you. You know, a sinner knows they need Christ, but a religious person thinks they're okay. And so God came to deliver us from religion. He came to deliver us from bondage. He came to deliver us from all the junk and all the darkness. And then He brings us over and puts us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. This day, when you make Jesus Christ Lord of your life, you're no longer part of the kingdom of darkness. You're the, in now the kingdom of God. Amen? And now Jesus is your Lord. And then he goes on and he says this, In whom we have redemption through his blood, which means the forgiveness of sins. Isn't that great? See, redemption means this. God has purchased us. He's paid the price for us to have a different life. Anybody hear me? You don't have to live the old lifestyle anymore. You don't have to live in sin. You don't have to live in condemnation. You don't have to live in guilt. You have to live in, in, in poverty, lack, and want. Why? Because we have redemption in Christ Jesus. 
Somebody says, well, if I don't have to live in all that stuff, why am I still living in it? Well, because the Bible says over in Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And then also in 3 John and verse 2, the Bible says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. In other words, if you don't change your mind to the Word and renew yourself to who you are in Christ, you're going to live and the devil will take advantage of you. Amen? But thank God we need to get into the Word of God and find out what God has done for us and then accept that. Well, how am I going to begin to activate the blessings of God and the provision of God and the goodness of God in my life? Well, you're going to have to do it by faith. Amen. You have to live by faith. In Hebrews eleven six, the Bible says, Without faith, it's impossible to please God, because he that comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Amen? In other words, faith doesn't just believe in God. Faith believes that God will do for us what he said he would do. Amen? Let me show you something. Look in Galatians, the third chapter. And, and, you know, we have Abraham as an example of God kind of faith. We have Abraham as an example that we're to follow. And so, you know, uh, Brother Hagin used to teach us all the time, you can't get Abraham's results with the Thomas kind of faith. Abraham's faith was based upon what God said. Thomas' faith was based upon what he could see. Amen. See, the Bible says in Romans 4 that Abraham believed according to what God had spoken, so shall your seed be. And, and Thomas came in and said, well, if I can't see him and if I can't put my fingers in the, you know, the nail holes, I'm not going to believe. And so, so, you know, Brother Hagin used to say so many Christians want to live by what they see. And if they can see it and feel it, then they'll trust God for it. But if we're going to really walk in the promises of God, we have to take God at his word. Amen. We have to do what Abraham did and learn how to operate in faith and activate those promises in our life. See, you didn't get saved just to hang on and hold out and get to heaven. That's what I thought. In fact, when I first got saved, I didn't like anything about the church. Didn't, I didn't like Christians. <laughs> and I, I hated their music. <laughs> Amen. And here I am, you know, I'm 20 years old, and the Lord appears to me in, 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 a, in, a, in a, one evening, a long story, I don't have time to get into it. But anyway, God, and I just know I've got to get saved. Or I'm, you know. And so I gave my heart to the Lord, and here was the deal I made with Jesus. I said, Lord, I don't like your church, I don't like your people, I don't like your songs. But, and my luck, I'll probably live till I'm 70 years old. That means I've got another 50 years I'm going to have to put up with that stuff just to get to come to heaven. Hallelujah. But I said, I'm going to do it because it's worth it. Praise God. Amen. <laughs> Well, thank God, whenever I gave my heart to the Lord, I found out that a lot of what I didn't like, He didn't like either. <laughs> Amen. I got me a Bible, started reading. I found out Jesus fussed at those people just as much as I fussed about them. Amen. <laughs> And so I found out that the Christianity wasn't religion. Christianity wasn't just hanging on. Christianity wasn't just someday make it to heaven. Christianity was a lifestyle. Christianity was walking with God. Christianity was having faith in God. See, faith is truly just this, having trust in God to do what He said He would do. It's putting your life in His hands, trusting Him, walking with Him, believing Him, acting upon His Word, and letting God show Himself mighty in your life. Amen? So in Galatians chapter 3, we have the example. In verse 5, he says, Therefore, Paul writing here says, He who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Now, he's saying this to, to the, the church of Galatia. He's saying, listen, when I came to you and, and had results and you got results in your life, did you do it because you did so much good works and you, you earned it? No. He said, you didn't get the blessings and stuff because you got good enough to get them. How many of you found out you can never get good enough to get the blessings of God? Anybody besides me come to that realization? And so Paul said, did you get this stuff because you earned it or did you get it because you had faith? You trusted God for it. You got it because you trusted God. That doesn't mean we aren't to do good works. We're supposed to come to church, read our Bible, pray, help people, do the good things. But those are not the things that are going to release the blessings of God totally in our lives. It's the act of faith of trusting God when we're doing those things. Amen. So he goes on and he says this, Just as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, therefore know that those who are of faith are the sons of Abraham. In other words, he says, if you want to get into righteousness, you have to believe God and have faith just like Abraham did. You have to accept Jesus as your Lord. You have to come into a righteous relationship with God and believe that He is the Son of God, that He died for your sins and God raised Him from the dead. Now He is Lord. And then you trust Him with your life and enter into a relationship with Him. 
And it has to be by faith. Why? You've never seen him. You've never walked up and shook his hand. You've never heard him stand in front of the pulpit and preach to you in person, but you have met him through the Spirit. You've met him through him touching your heart. You've met him through his word. You've met him through ministers standing and ministering. And while they're ministering, God's speaking to your heart and drawing you. So you have to you, you meet him by faith. Amen. And so when you reach out by faith and receive Him, then He becomes real in your life and He brings you into right standing with God, delivers you from bondage, brings you over into the light of God and makes you a part of His kingdom. Hallelujah. And you get that by faith. But then you go down here in verse 9 and it says this, So those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. Now once I, I become a son of God, a daughter of God, a child of God, and I, I put my faith in Jesus like Abraham put faith in God and was made righteous. So therefore, now if I'm going to go beyond that, I have to get in faith and believe like Abraham did according to the word to walk in the blessings. Amen? How many of you found out that the blessings of the Lord just don't fall on you like ripe apples off of a tree? You have to shake the tree. Amen. I'm going to prove it to you here in just a little bit. Faith is what it takes to cause the blessing to manifest in your life. It takes faith to be healed. It takes faith to get your needs met. It takes faith to get your prayers answered. Are you hearing me? And, and, and God says, it takes, it, you have to believe. It's a believing faith. It's not just, uh, I hope it happens, but it's, it's actually believing. In other words, it's purposeful faith that's acting on the Word because you believe God will do it for you. It's an action of trust that gets the blessing to come into your life. And so he goes on down here in verse 11 and finally says it this way, so that no one is justified in the, by the law in the sight of God, it's evident. And then he says this, for the just or the righteous shall live by faith. Now you know what he's done? God says you get born again by faith, you learn to operate in the blessings of God by faith, and then you develop a faith lifestyle. Amen? I don't just use my faith on Sunday morning. And I just don't live on, on, you know, for Jesus on Sunday morning. It becomes a lifestyle. See, Christ came to change our behavior. He came to change our attitudes. He came to change our, our actions and our deeds and how we treat people. And it's called a life of faith. And every day I get up and I trust Him. And every day I, I, I act like He's my Lord. And every day I live my life that He's going to be there for me. Amen? And by doing this, I began to partake of the inheritance. I learned how to operate in the things that He has for me. Because as a Christian now, I have to renew my mind to the Word of God. Because Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word. So therefore, I have to hear the Word, get in the Word, and find out how to live this life of faith. I have to learn how to get God involved in my situation. I have to learn how to get God to release His, His anointing in that and destroy the yoke. I have to, I have to learn how to, to bring God into my, my, my place where I'm at, where I can see His manifestation of His goodness in my life. And some people come along about now and they say, Yeah, but Brother Huffman, you know, I just believe if God wants to do it, He'll do it. How's that working for you? <laughs> Not very well. Because that's wrong. You see, you've got to understand something, folks. It doesn't say in Hebrews eleven six, 6, uh, but without needs, it's impossible to please God. It says it's without faith. It takes faith to move. God is a faith God, and He moves when we operate in faith. Faith is an action based upon God's Word. Are you hearing me? Faith is me stepping out and trusting God to do for me what He said He would do for me in His Word. I don't have anything to feel, don't have anything to, to digress, but I have His Word for it. And I know that God said in His Word, He cannot lie, will not lie, and He will watch over His Word to perform it for me. And so I enter into a relationship with God that I can trust Him with that. Amen? Now, look in Mark's Gospel, the fourth chapter. I want to give you real quickly just, just three good principles that will help you in your faith walk to release the harvest of blessing and get God actively involved in your life. And in this we find in Mark chapter 4 the Lord Jesus teaching on the kingdom of God. And, he, and, and all throughout this fourth chapter, the Lord is teaching us the parable of the sowers that is about the kingdom. And then in verse 26, He actually goes into the kingdom of God and He says, The kingdom of God is if a man should scatter or sow his seed on the ground. And should sleep by night and rise by day and, and, and the seed should sprout and grow up. And he himself does not know how, for the earth brings forth. Notice that the earth yields crops by itself. First the blade, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain ripens, notice that, when it comes to a full harvest, 
He says immediately he puts in a sickle and, and because the harvest has come. Now, when I begin to read that, what jumps out to me is this. Jesus is telling me that if I learn how to operate in the kingdom of God, he's going to prosper me. It's his will to bless me. Why? Because he just showed me how to get a harvest. How many of you know a harvest is better than a seed? Amen? Come on. Isn't the, isn't the answer to the prayer better than the prayer? I mean, thank God for praying, but you know what? Hallelujah when it's answered. Isn't the healing better than believing to be healed? Absolutely. And so the Lord has shown me how to go from a need to a harvest. He's showing me how to get the kingdom of God operating in my life, and it's an act of faith. And it operates through seed, time, and harvest. Notice he said in verse 26, the kingdom of God is, is as if a man should sow his seed into the ground. Now notice that he's using a, a natural uh, illustration for a spiritual truth. And when he says he sows it in the ground, he's actually, if you go back to Genesis 8.22, he's referring back to there when God reestablished his covenant with mankind after the flood with Noah. Because when Noah's, you know, the ark came to rest and Noah came out and offered an offering to God, God made a covenant. He reaffirmed his covenant with man. And in the 8th chapter, in verse 22, he says this, as long as the earth remains, there's going to be cold and heat. How many of you know there's still cold and heat? There's going to be day and night. Everybody knows there's day and night. There's going to be summer and winter. We all know that. But then he also said this, seed time and harvest shall not cease. Sowing and reaping. In other words, God says, with all this going on, there's going to be a process. If you give the earth seed, the earth is designed to bring harvest out of that seed. The earth will give life to that seed and turn it into a harvest for you. And you know what's a great? It's an earth law. Meaning what? It doesn't matter where you're at. You can give me seed that you are going to plant in your backyard, and I can take it to West Virginia and plant it in my backyard, and it'll grow for me. But here's the key. It won't grow if I don't plant it. Amen? And so the Lord is saying this. The earth was designed to receive your seed and give increase to it and bring it back to you as a harvest. Is that accurate? Can I say that? Say it again. The earth was designed by God to receive your seed, bring increase to it, and give it back to you as a harvest. That's what the earth does. It does it everywhere. It don't matter where you're at, the earth will do that. If you give the seed to the earth, water it, and cultivate it, the earth will produce a harvest and bring it back to you. Praise God. And the Lord says, just like it works in the natural, that's the way the kingdom of God operates. The kingdom of God is spiritual. He says the kingdom of God is just like that earth. The kingdom of God is designed by God to receive your seed and bring it back to you as a harvest of blessing in your life. Now, that tells me this. The earth responds to the seed. It reacts to the seed. Isn't that right? It's designed, the earth is designed to react to the seed. If you don't plant a seed, you don't get a harvest. Isn't that right? That's also telling me this. If you don't plant a faith seed and do what God tells you to do, the kingdom of God will not function in your behalf. It responds to your act of faith. Are you hearing me? Heaven right now is responding to your and my faith. That's why the Lord said, you have not because you ask not in James. That's why he said, in, in that day you'll pray and the Father will hear your prayers and grant your petitions. In other words, if I don't pray, I don't get anything. Why? Because the kingdom of heaven is designed by God to respond to our seeds of faith. Are you hearing me? And everything in the kingdom of God operates through a planted seed. What's a planted seed? It's an action of faith based upon what God's telling you to do. Amen? In other words, the reason some things aren't working in our lives is because the Lord's been trying to get us to do something and we haven't done it. Amen. See, this is the thing, folks. Somebody says, uh, well, I just don't believe in all that. Well, it's working for you. You're getting exactly what you're sowing. <laughs> Amen. And you th this is the thing. And, and, and you know, faith is, is kind of like having a pocket full of money. You know, you could have a hundred bucks in your, in your pocket and, and go to the store to get a loaf of bread that might cost you, what, a couple bucks or whatever, and walk out of the store and have no bread. And there was plenty of bread in the store. And somebody says, why didn't you get any bread? I don't know. It just didn't happen. 
Well, did you give them any money? No, still in my pocket. Well, guess what? There had to be a transaction with the store. You had to go in. The store was there to provide you the bread. It was a place that you could go get it. But you know what you had to do? You had to take the money that was in your pocket and give it to the store and then take the bread out of the store. Isn't that right? Huh? You know what God's saying to us? He says, every, every, every inheritance, every blessing, everything you need is already, you're qualified to get it. But here's the thing. You've got to come to me with your faith and sow your seed of faith and respond and receive from me what I have for you. Praise God. So you and I have to learn how to operate in this thing. And so the first thing you're going to do, the, the first key that you and I have to learn is this. You'll never sow a seed to God until God becomes your source. So the first key to successful faith is going to get you a harvest. You've got to make God your source. Number one, God has to become your source. Now you've got to learn the difference between source and instrument. See, there are many instruments of supply, but only one source. Did you hear me? What do you mean? I'm saying this. Don't make your job your source. Because when you do, that's the only avenue that God can work to bring you a blessing. Don't make your friends your source. Don't make, your, don't make the government. Don't make the, 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 you know, anything in the natural. Those are all instruments of supply. Make God your source. Are you hearing me? You have to do that. You have to, and the first seed that you sow is your heart to God and saying, God, from this day forward, you're my source. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 19, the Bible says, Paul writing to the church says, But my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Notice he says, But my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches in glory. Why do I need to make God my source? Because then I take it out of my realm and put it in his. Amen. Now, instead of my small circle of where I can draw from, I have God's infinite circle of His riches and glory that He can work in my life. Amen. See, I, I, I want to tell you something, folks. I've watched God move. I, I, you know, we, we shared in the earlier service, we were doing this project and, 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 and we had prayed and we'd gotten, you know, the youth had done, the children's part had done and we had all the guns and the last thing we had was an we had to put an elevator because it's upstairs and we want to get them up to the and so we had to put this elevator in to get all the kids that you know that might need it and all the different things and and make it accessible and it was like sixty some thousand dollars to get it done and that's the last thing we've got to do and hallelujah we didn't have any money to do it with hallelujah and so I'm praying and believing God in you, and, and, and we sowed seed, and we're trusting God. I said, God, I, we sowed our seed. I'm believing you. We're doing this for your glory, and, and you're my source, and I believe you supply this need. And, you know, we'd had this couple, and, and the, the, they were great folks in our church, at, at, you know, and they'd grown old. And the, uh, the, the gentleman had passed several years ago, but his wife went down uh, on the Gulf in, 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 in Mississippi, actually, to be with her children. And, and then she'd gone to be with the Lord, and, and so they brought her her up to the uh, Huntington to, to be buried beside her dad, by, beside her husband. And so I did the graveside service. And, you know, her, her daughters had married some really successful men. And they had their own business. And so they flew up on the corporate jet. Hallelujah. And so afterwards, we went over to our church. And we had a, a meal for them and a fellowship. And we knew the daughters. They'd been young, grown up. And, and so, uh, you know, we were friends. And, and so while I'm standing there... One of the young men comes to me and says, Pastor, you have a project going on. I said, I didn't know. He says, here in the church. I said, oh, I said, oh, yeah, we've got to finish out the elevator out here where we're getting, you know, where we came up. He goes, how much is that going to cost? Well, I forgot. I put in God's hands. So I told my son, I said, well, how much is that going to cost? So he went and got the cost. So I told him, he says, wait a second. He walks off. And he comes back and he says, you know, we prayed about it. We help churches out and do things. We sow and God's blessed us. Uh, we're going to write a check out and go ahead and put that in for you. Hallelujah. And so they wrote us a check for some thousand dollars to pay for the thing. My God shall supply all of my need according to His riches in glory. And so it, the church wasn't the, the means or the instrument of getting that done. When we put it in God's hands, He went outside of our church and moved with somebody from three or four states away and brought it in. And God doesn't just do that for a church. I've seen Him do that in my life. God has worked in people's lives and they've sowed to us from way somewhere else at a time where we needed Him to help us. Amen. So the very first thing you've got to do is you've got to say, God, I make you my source. 
I look to you in every situation. You're my healer. You're my provider. You're my protector. You're the God that's going to take care of me. And Lord, when I go into this, I'm going to look to you first. Amen. And then, Lord, however you want to do it, that's up to you. Amen. I tell everybody one of the illustrations about God supplying you need. Brother Copeland said this probably back in the late 70s. I heard him say this. It's been a few years. But, you know, he he made the comment. He said this. He said, "If, if, if you're believing God for money... And a cow walks up on your front porch with a bag of money in his mouth. Take the money and milk the cow and send it home. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. And you know what? I, I told everybody, I said, I questioned that. But then my brother-in-law was a dairy farmer. So I went to him and I mentioned to him about milking the cow. Because I thought, you know, it'd be bad to steal somebody's milk from their cow. And my, my brother-in-law said, no, if the cow's ready to drop her milk, the best thing you do is go ahead and milk it because it'd ruin it if you sent her home with all that milk in. I said, glory to God, hallelujah. <laughs> so I'm not only getting my money, I'm getting some milk to drink with it, hallelujah. <laughs> but you make God your source. And you look to Him. And however He brings it in, however He does it, you trust Him. Amen? Yeah. Second thing you do is this. Once you make God your source, you have to sow your seed. And a good scripture for that is Luke 6, 38. Give. And it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. In other words, I'm going to sow my seed. I'm going to give. I'm going to do what God's telling me to do. And this is the thing, folks. When, when we talk about giving, a lot of times our minds think to money. But you, you understand something that even with finances, your giving is, is not, the money is, that you give is not what's going to release the blessing back to you. The money is, is just an outward show of the action of faith and trust that you just put in God. Because the kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. Isn't that right? Yeah, yeah. So how are you going to activate the spiritual kingdom with a natural thing? No. If God tells you to give $10, that $10 is not your seed. It is your action of obedience to God and faith in God that is the seed. Are you hearing me? Because God isn't looking at the, the $10 bill. He's looking at your action of obedience to Him. He's seeing you sow the seed that He wants you to do. In other words, it's my faith and trust in God that's going to release Him to be able to multiply that back and bring it to me. Amen? Are you hearing me? And I always tell everybody, you know, Abraham, and when you sow your seed, it's funny because over in Genesis 14, you see Abraham going in and rescuing Lot and, you know, and destroying the enemies. And, and then he meets Melchizedek and Melchizedek blesses him and Abraham gives him a tithe and tells him you're blessed by God. And then these ungodly kings come to Abram and says, you know, we'll just bless you. And he says, no, I've lifted my hand up to God. God is my, God's going to take care of me. Then you get into the 15th chapter of Genesis, and it's really funny because the very first thing happens in that 15th chapter in verse 1 is the Lord appears to Abraham and speaks to him in a a dream. And he says, fear not, Abram. In other words, don't be afraid. How many of you ever said, I trust God, I'm making God my source, and you step out and do what he told you to do, and by the time you get to your car, you're going, oh my God, why did I do that? (laughs) Huh? Anybody besides me ever been there? I mean, you felt really great while you were doing it. And I just know I'm hearing from God. And Lord, I'm doing what you told me to do. And before you can get to the car, fear is trying to attack you and say, now what are you going to do? And so immediately the Lord comes to Abram in that because Abram just declared God as his source. You know what God does to Abram? He comes to him and says, Abram, don't be afraid. I'm your shield. I'm going to cover you and protect you and take care of you. Then he says, I'm your exceeding great reward. And the, and the Hebrew over there says, I'm your rapidly increasing wages. Glory to God. One translation says it this way, I'm your abundant provider. Hallelujah. Why did God say that to Abram? Because Abram had taken a stand. I'm going to trust God. And then he sowed his seed. I always tell everybody this. A revelation God gave me is this. You know, Abraham tithe. And if you're going to give, and I know you have projects going and you're giving and you're sowing, and God bless you for joining in because it's your church. Amen? This is your ministry and everyone's a part of it. But you know, when you bring your tithes to the church, don't, don't, don't make the tenth dollar of your tithes something that you owe. Make the first dollar of that tenth something you sow. Are you hearing me? See, there's a difference in giving it because you owe it and giving it because you're sowing it. It's not the seed you owe that's going to get multiplied. It's the seed you sow. 
So whenever, you know, whenever I have 10 bucks and I'm going to give God a dollar out of that 10 bucks, I don't give him the 10th dollar as something I owe him. Oh, here, God. No, I give him the first dollar as something I'm sowing to him. Hallelujah. Because I'm releasing my faith for God to move in my life. Are you hearing me? And so you do that. And so we begin to give and we begin to act and, and we begin to trust God and we begin to do what he tells us to do. And it's a life of faith. It's not just something you do when you have a need. It's operating the kingdom of God. Amen? It's you putting God as your source. It's you trusting God. It's you listening to God. And you being a giver in your life. Giving of, of, of friendship. Of giving of love. Of giving of, of, of uh, you know, hospitality. Giving of your, your gifts. You know, anything you give to God, He'll multiply it back to you. Well, I'm just not so talented. Then take that one little talent. Instead of wrapping it up and burying it in the ground. Why don't you take that talent and give it to God and watch Him increase it? Because if you'll plant it in the kingdom of God, he'll give increase to it. Some people come up to me and say, well, I'm going to leave the church. It's just not a friendly church. I said, well, in Proverbs chapter 18, it says for a man to have friends, he has to show himself friendly. Maybe you're the problem. <laughs> well, I just don't make friends easy. Well, that's a good confession. Why don't you make God your source? See, you can't give until you make God your source. Somebody says, I just can't give. Well, you've got to get back to step one. Make God your source. Because you'll never be a giver until God is your source. But when God becomes your source, then you know what you'll do? You'll come in and the Lord will say, go over there and say hi to that person. Well, I don't know that person. That's okay. That's that why you're going to say hi to them. Hallelujah. <laughs> and you know what? You go over there and you act and you give a, an act of kindness. And that person responds. And, you know, somebody else comes in. And first thing you know, you come to church and you know a lot of people. And everybody's and they're inviting you to get involved. Why? Because you sowed and did an action of, of, of spiritual act of faith and trusting God. And now the kingdom of God is working in your behalf and increasing that. If you're having a problem with confidence. You know what you do? You get in the Word and you begin to step out and say, Fear, you have no place in my life. Just like we sing the song. And you act in faith and you do something for God. And then you begin to believe God. And God begins to operate in your life and take fear and get rid of it. Take insecurity and get rid of it. Takes all the junk that the devil's trying to hold you down. And as you sow yourself and as you give that seed and put it in the hands of God, then God takes that thing and turns it around for you. And you begin to see transformation take place in your life. And what's the third part of your faith? First part is you've got to make God your source. Number two, you've got to sow the seed. The seed is the action of obedience that God is telling you to do. And then what's the third thing you've got to do? Believe God for a harvest. He said, he said when you sow this seed, He said it's going to produce a harvest for you. And now notice He said in Mark 4, it's going to produce first a blade, then the full thing, and then the harvest. In other words, everything doesn't just happen overnight. So that's why you live by faith. Because this isn't a get-rich-quick scheme. This is a lifestyle. And I trust God. Listen to me, folks. There are times I've had to trust God for days and weeks and months before I saw the results come to pass. Are you hearing me? But I just kept believing and kept praising Him. Because I knew there was a harvest coming in. And when the harvest comes in, receive it. Hallelujah. Why pray if you're not believing God to answer your prayer? Why speak your faith if you're not believing God to move the mountain? Are you hearing me? You put yourself in God's hands and you say, Lord, I'm going to live this life. And I'm going to put you as my source. I'm going to sow myself as a seed and give as you told me to give. And then I expect I would receive a harvest. I, I receive you turning this around and making it good in my life. Amen? Let's pray.